So hi, everybody. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, it's a real, real pleasure to be back with Paideia. Uh, I love this organization and all the great work it's done that it has been doing. Um, uh, I see some familiar faces, some familiar names, some names I haven't seen in a long time. I'm really touched, really happy to have you here. Um, so I was uh, delighted to be asked to talk about the book. It just came out a week or so ago. This is it here uh, with the beautiful... Um, the statue by Giovanni Strazza on the, uh, this is called the Veiled Virgin. Uh, it's a remarkable piece of Renaissance sculpture. So I have some slides I thought I'd share with you. You're welcome to use the chat. I assume it's being moderated. Um, and I'll, I would love to answer questions at the end. But in the meantime, I'm going to share my screen and show you some slides that uh, I've put together for you. Uh, and this is it. I'm going to minimize this and that. Here we go. So this is it. Uh, the title is How to Grieve, an Ancient Guide to the Lost Art of Consolation. That's what we're talking about. And you'll notice it says inspired by Marcus Tullius Cicero. I'll explain that in just a minute. But what I wanted to say first is this. Um, grief really is a very difficult topic. I'm going to be talking today uh, not just about bereavement in general, but specifically about bereavement of a child. This is generally seen as absolutely one of the most traumatic things in the world. So this is a, it's tough uh, for me sometimes. It may be tough for some of you on this call. And I wanted to just remind people that I'm an academic doing the best I can. I'm not a grief counselor. So um, I appreciate, you know, your your empathy toward me. And of course you have mine for you as well. So um, with that said, Jason just alluded to this. This uh, It's a wonderful series coming out of Princeton. Uh, we have a wonderfully inspired editor there, a guy named Rob Tempio. This is his brainchild, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Readers. And you see they're all called How To, How to Be Free, How to Give, How to Innovate. I've done a couple of books in this series already. Uh, the one in the lower uh, left there, How to Tell a Joke, was one I did last year. Uh, but this one's a little bit different. Uh, and I want to make this point really explicit because already it's come up in discussion. The series title is How to Do Something, right? And that suggests that we're prescribing or the ancients are prescribing how to do something. This is a title that was sort of imposed on the text I'm going to present to you. It would be better to call it How He Grieved, How Cicero Grieved When His Life Fell Apart. So it's more descriptive. And I, I hope you can keep that in mind. Uh, it's not, uh, I, I don't want to tell anybody how to grieve. There's all kinds of different ways and there's not really a single right way. Uh, there are different ways, but this is it. Here he is. This is Cicero, the uh, inspiration slash author of this text. His dates are down there below. He was born in 106 BCE in the little town of Arpinum, uh, not so far from Rome. He was assassinated in the year 43. And on the right, there's this beautiful reconstruction by a, an artist in Florence just a year or two ago. What's the background? This is what I wrote in the introduction of the book. First sentence, I said, after a stratospheric year as consul, a lot of you know that he thwarted the Catalinarian conspiracy that year. Well, Marcus Tullius Cicero was on top of the Roman world. Five years later, though, that world had turned on him. He was ostracized. He found himself pressured into exile. His property was confiscated or destroyed. His house was burned down. He spent a year and a half wandering in the middle of nowhere, aimless and adrift. He eventually got back, but a decade later, his wife left him. And Cicero immediately married again, but very badly. And he only did it for the money. We know this from all his letters. We know a lot about Cicero. Rock bottom, though, had yet to come. In the year 45, his beloved daughter Tullia died from complications of childbirth. She was only 32 years old. Cicero, uh, if you've read Cicero's letters, you know this. He's constantly praising her. She was the light of his life. And Cicero simply fell to pieces. He just fell apart. We know from his letters, he was spending time crying, wandering uh, around the woods in his villas. He couldn't pull it together. And familiar questions began to haunt him. He was asking himself, you, you may know these questions too, is there life after death? Are our loved ones in heaven? How could things go so wrong the way they did? And perhaps most pressing of all, is there any way to recover from something as earth shattering as the death of a child? So if you uh, are familiar at all with grief today, uh, you'll know that it's often sort of analyzed as a series of stages. This is the Kubler-Ross model, which originally was um, a, a terminal illness, not just bereavement in general. And it's come under some pressure by experts, but it's still very popularly accepted in um, uh, with almost anybody you'll meet, uh, the idea that grief 
produces denial that it's happened, then anger, then depression, then bargaining with God or something, and then often acceptance. Uh, this does apply, is, does work for some people. It, it doesn't always work this way for many people. But that's the model a lot of people know today. But Cicero doesn't say anything like that about grief. So in the weeks following Tullia's death, he holed himself up in one of his villas, and he read and he reread classical philosophical treatises on coping with grief. These were in Greek. By his time, this was an established genre. They called it the consolation. And we, we, we have a fair number of these actually today. We have a couple from Plutarch, or at least pseudo Plutarch. We have a couple from Seneca. You may have heard of Boethius, who comes to the very end of the entire tradition. Well, all those consolations were directed to other people when someone else lost a loved one. This is going to be a little bit different. In this one, Cicero was trying to console himself, and he took an interesting whatever works approach. So the fancy word for that is eclectic. He was selective. He didn't just subscribe to this approach or that approach. He combined every consolation technique he could find into one single approach in his consolation. We know this because he says it explicitly in the Tusculan Disputations. That's an important text that he wrote just a few months later. He says in there, there are some who collect all these consolation techniques for each person is moved by a different method in a way that's similar to how I combine them all into one approach in my treatise consolation. My soul was in a state of extreme torment and I was experimenting with every possible cure for my situation. That's the Tuscan disputation. So what were his two main sources? This is interesting if you have a little philosophical background, but I hope I can explain it. The two main sources were Platonism and Stoicism. And these are really very different. Platonists like Cicero believe in heaven. They believe there's life after death, specifically heaven after death. Stoics don't believe this. Stoics believe that death is the end, that death is the end of everything, and therefore the, the end of pain. Neither of these groups believe in hell. Cicero says this in a few different places, although there is one passage in here where he does seem to indicate maybe he thinks there could be hell. In the consolation, though, this is quite interesting. Cicero works through various proofs for heaven. He wants to prove to himself that the soul is immortal and that after we die, that it will rise up into the atmosphere. And he also says things like this. He addresses Tullia in heaven. He says, as for you, my precious Tullia, if you can hear me in death, you're happy. By dying once, you put an end to all the unhappiness you faced in life. You're freed from your problems. You're spared the ones looming, and you're sheltered now, safe and secure. He also says things much more shocking. He says this. This is an authentic quote. I will raise you up as a god in the imagination of all mortals. He's talking to his daughter. He wanted her to be worshipped as a god. Amazingly, Cicero said that this writing this thing worked. It was the consolation itself. It seems to have been sort of equal parts philosophy and equal parts persuasive speech. And it's kind of mind blowing. Cicero was supposed to be the most persuasive speaker in history. So apparently he decided to write a persuasive speech for himself. And he later boasted in a letter to his friend Atticus, he said he did something nobody had ever done. He says, quad, quad ante me nemo, nobody's ever done this. I talked myself out of depression. Or there's the the Latin, whoops, the Latin, ipse me per literas consolare. I sort of consoled myself or talked myself in this written composition out of depression. So that text was admired for many generations, but then it was lost at some point in or after the fourth century. All that remained were 23 fragments quoted in various authors like Lactantius, Pliny, Augustine, and Cicero himself. Those direct quotations add up to about 500 words. And we had another, we have another thousand or two uh, allusions to what was in the text from various other places. So Petrarch off here on to the right in the Middle Ages or early Renaissance, he rediscovered Cicero's letters, but he couldn't find this book. It, it did bother him. But here is the wild thing. In the year 1583, which is pretty late in Italy for the Renaissance, in 1583, the text sensationally resurfaced in the city of Venice. That's it off to the right. Or did it? So unlike most recovered texts, this one appeared as a printed book, not as a manuscript. And the book doesn't tell you where it came from. There's no introduction. There's no name attached to it of who could have been responsible for printing the book. 
And you can see the title there, Marci Tui Cicerones Consolatio. So the Marcus Tui Cicero's Consolation, Liber Quose Ipsum de Filiae Morte Consolatus S, the book whereby he consoled himself upon the death of his daughter, Nunc Primum Repertus. Now, for the first time, rediscovered et in Lucem Edites, and it's published, and so forth. So some people immediately suspected a hoax, and polemics broke out instantly, and they went back and forth for years and years. And the skeptics predominated, but there was never any conclusive proof of whether this thing was real or not. It ended up getting reprinted over and over and over, and it was in all of Cicero's opera Omnia for centuries. The short of it is it's not authentic. Um, it is, however, a truly impressive book written in Cicero's voice. And here is something, the amazing thing I discovered, the reason I published it. It's made up of hundreds and hundreds of source quotations from Cicero's essays and many other authors. So I'm going to show you. I built a website to prove it. I think the readership for all this data is very, very limited. It's all of you on the call at most. But uh, here's a sample of what it looked like. It, so in the paragraph number of the text that I've just translated, I went through and I found, uh, using computer searches, that these are close quotations or reworkings. Here's one from Tusculan Disputations. Here's one from Plutarch. Uh, here's another one from Plutarch. Here's one from Plato's Apology. Here's one from the uh, Cicero's Day on Friendship. Here's a free rewrite of, on divination, also by Cicero and so forth. If you're interested, I, the, uh, Cornell wouldn't let me host it, so I created my own website. It's classicsprof.com, and we can maybe put a link in the chat, or I'll show it to you after. Uh, I thought you might get a kick out of seeing this. The sources in summary. Now, if you cast your eye over any of these things, you're going to see Cicero's name over and over and over and over. Whoever wrote this thing, put it together, studied everything Cicero had ever written. Uh, and then everything else in the consolatory tradition that was relevant. I published an article about this a couple of weeks ago in the um, the new journal Antigone online. And I called it, I gave it a whimsical title, but because I wanted it to be memorable, I call it Jurassic Mark. And I said, this is like, uh, it's like uh, Jurassic Park where they want to restore the dinosaurs. So they use dino DNA for the connective tissue. That's what this person has done, or these people could have been a group. But that's really not what I'm interested in today. I could tell you about that later if you're interested. Here, I hope to talk to you about what, in terms of consolation, what works, what Cicero thought works, and how and why he thought those things when it comes to consoling grief. So here's the beginning. The first sentence of this text, Cicero writes, I know the experts say not to treat recent traumas. And I know that in human life, no tragedy should strike us as surprising or unexpected. Still, though, I have to try if there's any possible way to fix myself and stop my world from caving in. So it's a, it's a really arresting sentence. And what it tells us right away is this essay is born of desperation. It was never supposed to be this way. It's our first hint that Cicero is going to write things he wouldn't have written if he'd ever uh, if he'd written this essay a decade before. That first sentence is breaking a so-called commandment of the Stoics. There's a famous philosopher named Chrysippus. Some of you may have heard of this guy. He was a Stoic. Uh, and Chrysippus wrote a famous book called, uh, in English, you could say, On Negative Emotions. And book four is called The Therapies. The th uh, here it is. And in it, Chrysippus says at the start, there's the Greek for you, he says, here's the way to provide psychotherapy. At the moment somebody's emotions are inflamed, don't worry about the doctrine, which has previously won the patient over. What does he mean by that? In other words, he means when someone's in the throes of grief, don't worry about what philosophy or religion they believe in. I mean, he's saying you don't preach atheism at someone at a funeral when the parents are grieving. That's not the right moment. Don't try and convert somebody to a new religion or a new worldview. The idea is you use whatever works for that person on that person's own terms. But the most important thing is you're supposed to be preparing to cope with death now, before grief strikes. Don't wait until your loved one has died, because at that point, these ideas aren't going to work on you. It's too late. So what comes next? Here's the contents of the treaties, basically. The consolation starts out on a deeply pessimistic note, but then it gradually grows in optimism, almost kind of like a symphony. It begins with rationalizations of what has happened. Cicero convinces himself that death is better than life. 
which is a really bleak and horrible thought, but he goes on and on and he tries to prove it to himself over and over that death is preferable to life. But the treatise, as it starts to grow in optimism, it concludes with Cicero's sincere conviction that his daughter is happy and safe in heaven and waiting for him. By the way, these are platonic views, the idea that death is better than life and that our loved ones are up in heaven. But then Cicero goes a step further and he, he says, my daughter is not only in heaven, but if I can convince people of it, Tullia must be a bona fide God up in heaven. I'll say a little bit more about that after. How does it break down? There's about 215 sections. The first third is on the theme of death is better than life. The second third, though, is really about grief. Cicero says excessive grief is beneath us. We shouldn't be doing that. He says grief is pointless. It's illogical. And it's also under our control. He gives us many, many, many examples of courageous conduct in the face of grief. And he also has a, a, a sort of a longish demonstration or argument that death is not as painful as we think it might be. The last third transitions up to argue that our souls are immortal. And in particular, heroic souls, saintly souls, are going to be elevated in heaven. Therefore, he argues, Tully is in heaven. And since she was a hero to me personally, I will, if I can pull it off, make her a god. So, but what about day-to-day -day uh, coping, rather? Cicero takes a two-pronged approach borrowed from Stoicism, again, from this guy Chrysippus, and we know this from the Tusculan Disputations, and you can see it in action here. The idea is to use cognitive therapy. By that, we simply mean therapy where you're actively thinking your way through it, what you might call it reason or rationality. And if we use cognitive therapy, therapy we're going to teach a person that grief is unnecessary. The second Stoic approach is to study role models of these people who survived tragedies before us, heartbreaking tragedies before us, because that demonstrates that tragedies are survivable. I'm going to talk about both of these. The first point, grief is unnecessary, is kind of a bracing thing to say. But the Stoics say, and Cicero echoes, he says, it's wrong to think that by grieving, we're fulfilling some kind of duty. We don't owe anyone grief. We don't owe it to ourselves, to each other, to the other, to the deceased. They say our tears can't do the dead person any good. I mean, what? And I mean, that seems sort of obvious. Your tears are not going to help that person. But then they have this other idea. Our loved ones wouldn't or maybe don't. They don't want our tears anyway, would they? I mean, would you want your whole family crying? I think many people would not. They would want you to be happy. Cicero says we shouldn't second guess God. He has a long section where he argues that our lives are not on a fixed time span. You don't get 80 years and it's over. We don't know when our time comes, but there's this vague idea of providence or maybe the gods that have made a determination for how long we should be here. And if we get upset at death, it's really calling God's wisdom into question. Furthermore, every one of us dies. He says, birth itself is a death sentence. There are no exceptions to this rule. I want to show you a passage of Epictetus. He's a Stoic thinker. Many of you probably heard of this guy, maybe read some of his stuff. This is one of the most famous passages in his handbook to Stoicism. He says, when it comes to something, this is the translation, the wonderful translation of Chris Francese at Dickinson College. He says, when it comes to something appealing or useful to you, or something you cherish, Remember to tell yourself what sort of thing it is. So start with the smallest things and work your way up. For instance, let's say you cherish a pot. Say to yourself, it's a pot that I cherish. That way, when it breaks, you won't be upset. When you kiss your child or wife, tell yourself it is a human being that I am kissing. That way, if one of them dies, you won't be upset. Now, this, when I read this with students, uh, this usually generates enormous discussion. I hope it's not too bracing to just present it like this to you, but this is an important uh, line of thought here, that you have to take a human being, by definition, is going to die. And so we need to moderate our behavior that way, uh, keeping in mind that people are only mortal. The second long section deals with these model responses, illustrations from Greek and Roman history. And so Cicero begins listing scores, when I say Cicero, I mean the treaties here, begins listing scores of examples of people, both men and women, who survived the loss of a child and they didn't fall apart. Uh, and he concludes from this, I'll get back to this, that grief is a choice. It's one we can control if we can only get our value judgments right. 
So for example, we get uh, Pericles. He says, Pericles lost two sons, extraordinary young men, in just four days. He was so strong and unwavering in his grief, though, that he didn't change a single thing in his conduct or appearance. On the contrary, he kept to his schedule of public meetings, and he never removed the garland from his head. We get the example of Cornelia. Uh, he says, consider that brave and glorious remark of Cornelia's. She had already lost 12 children when she saw her sons Tiberius and Gaius assassinated. Instead of getting paralyzed by fear or traumatized by grief, she said, I would never call myself unhappy. I bore the Gracchi. A third example I thought you might be interested in, Lucius Aemilius Paulus, famous general. Paulus lost two sons just days apart with almost no sign of grief. Rather, says Cicero, in the speech he gave before the people reporting on his accomplishments, he thanked the immortal gods for bringing down upon himself personally whatever adversity was threatening the Roman people. So why do we have these role models? Well, according to Cicero, these role models prove that grief can be stifled, that grief is not inevitable. Now, this is the important thing. That doesn't mean that repressing grief is easy but it is humanly possible. If you think about other things in life that people say they could never do, uh, that's not really often true, is it, right? I mean, you see somebody do 150 pull-ups and you think, wow, all right, well, maybe I could do one or something. So it shows that certain things are possible. But here's the other important step, and this is going to be familiar to anybody who's read Kant or philosophy. Just because something's possible, does that mean it's a good idea? This is what they call going from is to ought. The Stoic attitude is surprisingly and very challenging. Uh, surprising Stoic attitude is that, yes, they say grief should be totally suppressed. Now, I got to be careful, though, because there's no single Stoic dogma. There's just Stoics who fight over these things. Seneca, for example, I think sort of he, he takes it easy on this one. He doesn't like this. But they generally say grief should be totally suppressed. For them, grief is a conscious choice. Even more, it's an indulgence. It's something we're doing for ourselves. Now, in the treaties here and in the Tuscan, Cicero rejects this view. He thinks that's wrong. He thinks it goes too far. And it's important to remind you, Cicero was not a Stoic. All over the internet, they call him a Stoic. That's not true. Cicero was what was called an academic skeptic. And that's tough because both of those words have changed their meanings. It basically means he was agnostic. That's kind of the closest we have word we have today for his philosophy. Cicero says repressing grief is inhuman and it's a mistake. Here's a quote from the treatise. He said, you see, you'd come across as unnatural and inhuman if you felt no grief at all since death is shocking and naturally forces out signs of pain and grief. I wanted to show you something. Here is a statue I bet almost everyone on the call has seen. This is Laocoon. You know him from book two of Virgil's Aeneid, or you know this particular statue from the Vatican Museums. Why? His sons are being uh, devoured by the snake that he's trying to wrench off there. Look at his face. Do you see the wrinkles on his forehead? The wrinkles are the corrugators of your forehead naturally coming together. The most interesting article about this was by Charles Darwin. He wrote something on the expression of emotions in man and animals. And uh, he circles these foreheads and he says, look at these deep creases. When someone dies, the corrugators will contract and they sometimes don't stop for months on end. I just saw a picture in the news the other day. As soon as I saw it, I couldn't believe it. This was right after the death of the queen. Here's her son. And you can see the characteristic muscles. Those don't show up from age. That's Those are the grief muscles contracting. Cicero doesn't say this, but he seems to be uh, in sympathy with the view that this is a natural reaction. Cicero does say, though, that excessive grief is inhuman, too. And he says, in the same context, what I do object to is abandoning ourselves to grief so much that we find ourselves criticized for the opposite attitude, and maybe worse. He says, in the same way, if you overindulge in grief, people will say you're forgetting what it means to be human, and that you're rejecting our universal condition, namely that we have to die. I, this this question takes excessive grief takes on some urgency this year. I don't know how many of you follow these things, but about six or seven months ago, psychiatry, for lack of a better word, annexed grief. They now uh, psychiatry now considers grief its proper domain. This was quite controversial, and it was a move that was sort of uh, psychiatry been trying to get for about fifteen or twenty years. 
And so now, it, uh, according to psychiatry, if you can't get over grief within a in the span of a year, you will be diagnosed with what's now called prolonged grief disorder. Uh, and so there's a lot about this in the news. I'd encourage you to look into it if you're interested. Cicero actually addresses this idea, and he has one of the most poignant passages in the whole treatise here. He thinks that prolonged grief works like this. He says that thinking about a lost friend or relative or child makes us so happy because it feels like the person is practically standing before our eyes, that even though thinking of that person rips the pain back open and makes us cry, we still don't want to stop. So Cicero would not have thought it was a mental illness. Cicero has a different explanation for the same phenomenon. The upshot of all this, though, is that Cicero agrees that grief can be controlled cognitively by thinking about it. Cicero says we have to stop thinking of death as bad and start thinking of it as good for all these reasons he's given. But he says you have got to do this now before tragedy strikes. And in the treatise, he says, I'm writing this for other people as much as myself. I hope to help them. And he says that way will be mentally tough when disaster hits because disasters are inevitable. They are a part of life. So the final part of the consolation I want to share with you as I wrap up here before questions, the treatise ends with the apotheosis, the divinization, let's say the calling a god of Tullia. Cicero addresses his daughter directly. He's convinced himself that she's now a god, or you might say a saint, up in heaven. The rhetoric is extraordinarily moving, and it's convincing. It sounds exactly like things I have heard from bereft parents in my own life. Some of you may have heard these things before. Uh, this, by the way, is a statue in Buffalo, New York, that I absolutely love. It's titled Grief. Cicero says in this treatise at the end, but when fortune took, he says, I had a very difficult span of years there. But when fortune took you from me, Tolia, that was the final straw. It was only then that I really, truly understood the power of fortune, of luck, of circumstances over human affairs. I understood the true extent of the violence fortune had mustered against me. And the only thing left I could say was this, I give up, it's over. I was so badly wounded that grief completely overwhelmed and defeated me. Then, though, he gets optimistic. He says, now, though, I'm going to speak of you. I refuse to call you lost or utterly taken from me, since the glory of your name and your greatness dawns and enlightens my thoughts every day. You will live alive in memory as long as, as, well, long as monuments bearing brilliant witness to your towering glory shall stand, which, because they're so beautiful, I must hope will last for all time. And then he says, there's no thought, you see, that I can hear said or replay in my mind more wonderful than this, that for the daughter that I loved absolutely and who deserved and won my absolute love, I am eternally devoted and thankful. And at the very last bit, he says, but now the lessons of wisdom have hardened me against all the violence of fortune. And you, Talia, are a God in heaven. It fills me with all the pleasure and happiness a heart can hold. I'm trembling all over with joy and I triumph in victory over fortune and all her sorrow. And then he, in the last paragraph, he says, Tullia, the glory and memory of your greatness and your virtues were always of such wonderful help to me. Now that you're apart from mortals, don't forsake me. No, turn your eyes toward me and lead me to the place where at long last I can look upon and speak with you. That way you can repay the father who loves you with all his heart. Repay him however you like. And I will make sure that the joy of our reunion eclipses all the heartache and pain I felt at saying goodbye. So it ends on this optimistic note. So I thought I would stop there, uh, Dixie, I'm done speaking, and I thought I could suggest some questions or topics I could maybe answer questions about, or we could all discuss as a group, however we want to do this, uh, things that might um, you might be interested in. Why does Cicero believe in heaven? Why does he believe the soul is immortal? What's the point of all these role models? How does he convince himself that Tully is not just living forever in heaven, but she's a new God? The rhetorical strategies, more about Stoicism or Platonism, connections with Christianity. Or maybe you're interested in the Latin or my translation or the sources or something else. But thank you for your attention. I'll stop to share. Thank you so much, Mike. That was fascinating um, and uh, expeditiously uh, rolled out too, which we appreciate. We have time for questions, which is great because um, it's very thought-provoking and moving topic.
Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can, uh, I will give you the ability to unmute yourself. Where do I do that? Uh, yes. And you already have the ability to start your video. So you can uh, raise your hand using Zoom. Um, and uh, it looks like we have one already, which is uh, John uh, Kolasar. John? Yeah, yes. Uh, th th thank you very much for, for the talk, Professor. My, my question was whether, uh, if, if, I, if I understand correctly, Aristotle does not believe in the immortality of the soul on the grounds that the, the soul is the form of the body and therefore can't survive the body's death. Does Cicero ever talk about this or any similar subject? That's a great question. It's a bit above my pay grade because I think, I think you're right about Aristotle. Uh, but Cicero is not really interested in Aristotle, so he never mentions Aristotle. He's a Platonist, uh, like Plutarch and a number of other thinkers that uh, some of us read rather routinely. So uh, they have an ardent belief that the soul is out there. It's an ideal form. Are you familiar with Platonism? Yes. Yeah, okay. I can, maybe I could just say a word about this for, for others on the call that maybe aren't. Plato was very impressed with geometry. And if you think back to when you learned geometry in school, do you remember they taught you that you could never draw a perfect triangle. You could never draw a perfect circle. You can never draw a perfect line. Your hand's going to squiggle. Or, but you could imagine a perfect circle. You can imagine a perfect triangle. Uh, so Cicero was, uh, uh, Plato was deeply impressed with this idea. And he thought that everything that we see in the world was like a triangle or a circle. And so that we are all these flawed copies of a perfect version of, of something else that's up in the upper atmosphere. Uh, if you know the famous painting, the fresco by Raphael, the School of Athens, um, I, I didn't prep it here, but we could find it briefly enough. Plato is pointing up in the sky and Aristotle, to get back to the question, is pointing back down at the ground. He says, no, 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 that stuff's not real. Uh, you know, keep your eyes focused on the ground. So Aristotle, just to reiterate the question, doesn't feature in this treatise at all. Thank you. All right, I am keeping a speaker's list. Uh, I'm going to read Yvonne's uh, question first, and then next will be Patty. And you can uh, raise your hand if you want to add yourself to the list. I'll, I'll keep it keep it going. Um, so Yvonne asks, uh, she says, thank you so much. And then she asks, did Cicero believe in just one God? That is a very difficult question to answer. Uh, the tendency of all the philosophers is to wind up with one God. I think that's fair to say. I don't, I mean, I'm always reluctant to say these things because I, I'm not the philosopher in my department here and they, they're always correcting me, but I think it shows up uh, even as early as Homer, certainly in Aeschylus, everybody's tending toward monotheism, but you can never really pin them down. Uh, and so with Cicero, he definitely talks about the gods uh, and then he sometimes talks about just God. And, you know, in Latin, there's no the, so, of course, in Greek, there is a thought, but even so, you still don't know which God they're talking about. But it does seem to be generally a single God that he is thinking of. Thanks, Mike. Um, next question is from Patty Kuhlman. Patty. Yes. So I was curious whether Cicero or the other philosophers make a distinction between suppression and not revealing to to others, you know, whether there's some sense of privacy related to grief. Boy, that's a really good distinction. I don't, the Stoics don't. They want you to stifle it. Yeah. Uh, I, I've been talking about some of this with grief counselors. They are definitely not recommending it. They're saying that's not a helpful coping strategy for a lot of people. Uh, and it could be a damaging coping strategy. The, Cicero does not draw that distinction. There is, uh, uh, among Cicero's letters, we have a consolation to him by a friend of his when Tullia dies. And it's one of the most horrible things I've ever written. I don't know if any of you on the call have read this letter, but um, uh, it's right there in, in Cicero's letters. I, got, I think it's Sulpicius Severus. That might not be right. But the guy basically says, you need to man up, Cicero. You have responsibilities. You know, keep your private problems private. We don't want to hear it. And uh, it, it, it's really like, it's horrible. So I didn't mention it in the book here. Uh, and, um, but, you know, even from Cicero's letters alone, you can tell that I, I, they were 
processing the emotions in the way that we talk about. So it's a great question. I don't know that I can answer it in a way that's going to make either of us happy though. Yeah. What were the verbs of, if you recall, some of the verbs related to suppressing or manning up? Uh, well, Latin, the Romans are always talking about see weir s if you're a real man. I'd have okay. to go back and find it. Uh, I mean, the Romans are pretty unapologetic about using that kind of language, right? Uh, and it's built in, there's a section in here, I think I mentioned in the book, it's built into the idea of weirtus, which I translate as greatness in the book. But it apparently is the case that Tullia is the first woman in all of Latin literature to be called, as Tullia is the first woman in Latin literature uh, that is said to have weirtus, virtue. I mean, we're so used to the word. In fact, in English, virtue tends to suggest more of a female quality, I think, in, in contemporary usage. Um, mm -hmm. But it was seen as a paradoxical thing. So I translated it a few times, manfulness, to show the paradox where Cicero is saying, you know, this is supposed to be a quality of men, and here we are falling to pieces. That's not the way, men, and here are all these women that are better than we are. We should at least be doing what they're doing. So then follow up, are there any examples given of female grieving as different or? In the treaties, he's only giving us women and men who totally repress it or they, it. Uh, he gives the Spartan mothers, for example, the kids come back and he talks about how uh, they come back from war. And if the wounds are in the front, then they celebrate. And if the wounds are in the back, the mothers won't even look at the kid and deny them public burial. There must be five, six, seven, eight, ten examples of women in the treaties. There's, a lot. There's too many examples, which is one of the giveaways. Uh, there's about 40 or 50 of them in here, um, okay. but not, not quite any different than that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Brian Briggs, who asks, how much evidence do we have about the structure of Cicero's original treatise versus the Renaissance treatise? It's a great question. There is an article that I referenced in the book. I also, um, I might be able to pull it up on the chat. Give me a quick second. There is uh, a terrific scholarly article on exactly that issue uh, by Han Baltussen down in Australia. This is it here. I'm going to put it in the chat and it should, it should link up uh, with the link directly in there. It did not, so you got to go Google it. But there you go. Um, so that's the scholarly treaties. This one is built. Uh, the, um, this one is built off of all the known fragments, uh, but better, I think, than the scholarly treaties because it went through the entire consolation tradition and on the understanding, which surfaces in some of those polem polemical pamphlets, that there's not an infinite number of role models. Right. Uh, in the U.S. context, for many years, it was Theodore Roosevelt. Some of you may know that his mother and his wife died on the very same day. Uh, that was seen as uh, just uh, and Roosevelt, who later became famous for his so-called stoicism, just fell to pieces. He moved out to the Dakotas and so forth. Um, there would not be an infinite number of those examples in Rome. So the rationale is anytime we find them in Jerome or we find them in uh, um Valerius Maximus and these other sources, that they must have been quoted from Cicero's consolation, that that would have been the funnel that had caught all of these things. Uh, so my own, uh, I think this is the best reconstruction of the text uh, by quite a long mile that we will ever see. Um, thanks. I'm, I'm going to jump in with just a comment of my own um, before I continue to the next question, which is kind of inspired by Patty's comment, which is, I guess that I, your, your talk is making it occur to me how sort of we have this expectation in Western culture that we need to sort of control emotion and that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to feel okay all the time. And so then things like grief are like pathologized. Um, and that one needn't necessarily see it that way. I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, an Eastern worldview, like a Buddhist worldview, which sees, you know, the essence of human experience as suffering or dissatisfaction or whatever. And, you know, would would think that it's okay to not be okay <laughs> uh, sometimes. And I wonder, it just, it just 
you know, the can it, uh, I find it very ironic in some ways that the that the uh, that the psychiatrists have um, or the psychologists have, have have chosen to pathologize grief now officially uh, because it's you know is it really a sickness or is it just a natural process? I just, on that last note, I'll t I, there's boy, there's a lot to talk about there, but this is fascinating right now for prolonged grief disorder. Psychiatry does not recommend any kind of um, pharmacological intervention, no drugs, right? No pills, no shock therapy. They're recommending cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy is stoicism. The people who came up with cognitive, this guy, Ellis, I think it's Albert Ellis. He went back to stoicism from Seneca and uh, Epictetus, and that is where cognitive behavioral therapy actually comes from. Donald Robertson, that's a name some of you may know. Um, he's done a lot of this kind of thing, and he's written some absolutely brilliant articles showing the history of that. So at the moment, the recommended strategies are actually stoic. I mean, modified, I assume, but kind of neat. It's amazing. Um, all right, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, what are some of the strongest rhetorical devices that you notice in the Latin? Well, let's say uh, is if the question is uh, rhetorical device, the, the Latin is phenomenally Ciceronian. Think of the hardest Ciceronian Latin that you have read. And it's like that. It's got it all. The anaphora, I forget all those terms, but you know what we're talking about. The leaving out the and, the adding in the and, the trajectio where you're separating. There's not too much of that, but there is some separation. There's displaced word order. All of that's in there. The forger who put this together had obviously used this um, lexicon to Cicero that had come online probably 50 years before him. Uh, and if you know this uh, this book, it's this it's kind of obscene in retrospect, but it's, it's a dictionary of Latin that Cicero used and only the words he used. And this gives rise to this sort of fanatical movement called Ciceronianism that Erasmus eventually sort of stuck a pin in and that ended that. But the idea that if Cicero didn't use the word, it was bad Latin. And if Cicero is not on record as having used the word, then you can't use it when you write Latin yourself. The whole thing sounds kind of nuts to me, but it was pretty popular for a long time. So uh, that's a long way of saying that it's very Ciceronian and the rhetorical there. The argumentative strategy, the arguments that he uses are the toughest ones that you see in Epictetus. And I, I wrote a blog post about this, uh, actually for um, a psychiatry website, where I said, you got to be familiar with the argumentative strategies. All the ancient philosophers, uh, you know, Lucretius, Cicero, Epictetus, everybody, they start with a simple example that's familiar. And then they go, the second example is not the next down the line. It's an extreme example. So if you think back um, to the second book of Lucretius and the De Rerum Natura, he's arguing that pleasure or survival is better than feeling good inside. He says, imagine a man drowning out there in the Mediterranean Sea. Doesn't it feel pleasant to sit there and think, oh, I'm glad I'm not that guy. And it's, it's, it's just like really strange thing to say. Well, I'm happy that the guy is drowning. He says, no, you're not happy that you're not drowning, but you wouldn't actually trade places with the guy. So I called it sort of reductio ad extremum. You sort of reduce it to the most extreme form you'll see. Like Epictetus goes from, you have a pot to a human being, your wife or child, and you skip all the interim steps. But it's the idea is that if you realize the last step is plausible, you'll be okay with the interim steps. All right, I've got uh, Mary, then Aiden, and then Alex on the list. So Mary asks, um, this is more of a general question. How do scholars normally prove the veracity of rediscovered documents? And why was Cicero's consolation different? That's a great question. Uh, rediscovered documents, well, sometimes there's forensics, right? I mean, if the thing shows up and it's printed on a dot matrix printer and you're calling it a manuscript, we know that's not true. If any of you know what a dot matrix printer used to be, we don't have those anymore. Uh, so there's forensic stuff like that. They can look at the ink. You see this in the art world, right? The people are forging paintings and they're using chemical based paints that were not available in the Renaissance. Uh, when it comes to what I did in this book, uh, it is more like what they call forensic linguistics. And a friend of mine said, this is how they caught the Unabomber with the same thing you did. You basically, you study the word choices and you figure out that people have certain ticks and so forth. 
The most famous example of this for all of you, you need to know if you don't know this, is the donation of Constantine. Have you heard of this famous thing? In the history of Latin literature, there was this document where the Roman emperor allegedly, Constantine allegedly bequeathed all the authority and power and wealth to the Pope. That's a pretty useful document if you have that. But then in the early Renaissance, I think it was, it was it Lorenzo Valla, Jason, who went through and he said the Latin is all medieval. This is not the way that people wrote in the fourth century. And so he put a pin in that and the whole thing fell apart. Uh, so that's the most famous example. In this case, uh, I wrote in the article that I put in Antigone, and I hope you'll read it if you're interested in that. Uh, a computer study came up in 1999 and they tried to compare word usage for like this forensic linguistics uh, to see if they can make a case and it concluded that it probably was not authentic. Uh, and I went through and I described this in the article, but I was searching for certain words and I found sort of a plagiarized passage in Toto from one of Cicero's works into this one. And right around the same time, I broke my ankle and I was stuck sitting on my behind for 12 weeks by doctors who just couldn't go anywhere. And so I was like, well, what am I going to do? So I started Google searching obsessively. Hard it was awful. And I must have done thousands and thousands and thousands of searches. And I went through and hang on, maybe I can just show you what I did. Do I have my website up here? This is it. Let me just share my screen. And briefly, this is it. So I went through and these are all linked to Perseus. You could just click there if you have your book and you can see exactly where each and every single sentence, as far as I could tell, came from. So just in section one, you're looking at quotations from the Tusculan Disputations that are in Plutarch's Consolation Apollonius, different piece of the Tusculan Disputations, on and on, Cassius Dio, and so forth and so on. Uh, I don't know if anyone will ever use that, but it's there now. Thanks a lot. Uh, next up is... Aiden. Again, Professor, for this uh, lecture, uh, I just wanted to ask, um, on the topic of moral exemplarity, uh, you mentioned, although this work is seemingly forged, uh, that as you were going through and cross-referencing and finding all of these Ciceronian exempla, right, which were taken out and repurposed, was, were there any differences you noticed uh, in the treatment of exempla both along the lines of gender, but also of national origin, that is, between Roman and Greek, and also between, you know, man and woman, besides just the, the clear distinction and virtues which would be praised for the respective, you know, genders at that time. You're right on, Aiden. You got the answer already. He does exactly that. He distinguishes both gender and national origin. He says, you know, the Greeks have all these examples. Well, 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 we Romans aren't so shabby either. Let me quote a whole bunch of those. And even the barbarians have got a few that we know about. And then he, he goes in, uh, in that passage I already mentioned, where he gives the, the list of women. And he says, you know, us men, what's our problem here? If women can do this, well, we, they're, he says awful things these days, like they're more prone to emotionality and so forth. And we're not going to let the women be more stoic than we are. So we better really get with the program. So it's all there. Yeah. Well, I just want to correct one word. I heard you said allegedly forged. It's not alleged. It's definitely, it's conclusive. It's forged. So I can't let that escape the lab. All right. Uh, and Alex. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? I can. It's good to see you. How are you doing? Good to see you, Professor. Um, thank you for the uh, lecture. Um, certainly, always, always learn a lot. Um, my question, I have two quick questions, and I apologize if it's a repeat from anything. I was a little bit late. Um, but the first is, do we have any idea of how this was received sort of when Cicero was writing it by his contemporaries or by even the people that were teaching him in the schools later? And then my second question is, is there any evidence that the medical schools in Greece did pathologize sort of grief or other mental illnesses in, in any way? I got great answers for both. I'm actually happy. So the first one is the, the contemporary reception of Cicero's consolation is from Cicero's own letters and his last philosophical treatises. So the Tusculan Disputations, he might mention it in On Duties, he might not, I can't, I'd have to go back and check, but that's the immediate reception. Then it shows up again in um, Jerome, St. Jerome for some people. I think it's Epistle 60 is dedicated to this. Uh, and then there are sections of Valerius Maximus that probably come from Cicero, although they could be coming from the source. So it gets muddier to try and tell what's coming, right? Because it's not totally original when he wrote it, what's going there. 
Uh, but the most extensive quotations come from this guy, Lactantius. He's a pretty interesting guy. He was called a Christian Cicero in the fourth century, converted to Christianity after a long education in the pagan classics. And uh, he quotes long, long stretches of it. And so um, that's the last bit we have there. The second question about pathologizing grief, the person to look here to is Galen. Do you know Galen, the, um, the most famous medical doctor of the Roman Empire? So uh, he wrote in Greek. He wrote a lot. I think he wrote like a third of all the extant Greek literature or something like that. Just 15 years ago, a grad student from France rediscovered in a monastery in Greece his treatise Peri Alupias, getting on getting rid of grief. Because Galen owned a magnificent library in Rome. It's full of all his books, all of his prescriptions, medical instruments. The whole thing burned down. And so Galen wrote a treatise all about uh, the root word there, lupe, is the normal word for grief. And so there it's not bereavement of a child, but it is loss and that sort of thing. Galen did not think it was medical. By and large, uh, he was part a platonic philosopher, eclectic platonic philosopher, and part doctor. 